scriptures from Matthew 14, verses 13 to 21. Hear now the word of life. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that we may go, so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the word of life. Thank you, Edwin. Let us pray. Holy God, as we have come before your scriptures, as we have come before your word, may we open ourselves up, not just to read these words, but to allow these stories and to allow your spirit to read us so that we might be fed as well. Amen. What do you do when you're at your wit's end? When things are overwhelming, when there's just too much going on, when bad news has just broken, when you're coming to the end of your rope? Do you check out? Do you shut down and maybe go straight to sleep? Do you eat? Do you stop eating? Do you drink? Do you double down and work harder? Do you pray? Do you act as if nothing's really happened? What do you do when you come to your wit's end, when it feels like life is too much and it's just bursting at the seams? If you've got your Bible open to this morning's passage, to Matthew chapter 14, I invite you to look down at it again. We're looking at verse 13. You'll see that those first words, at least in the NRSV, which a lot of us have here, are something like this. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. Now, when Jesus heard this, when he heard what? I'm hoping that you're getting to this point where you're feeling more comfortable asking questions of Scripture and maybe flipping through and seeing that you can find some of these answers. So maybe you already looked at the top of chapter 14. Maybe you started reading verses 1 to 12, or maybe your Bible or the Bible in front of you has a little heading at the top, and it says something along the lines of the death of John the Baptist. John child of Elizabeth who jumped in her womb when Mary came to her home? John, that ragamuffin, locust-eating disciple who came from the wilderness. John, the cousin of Jesus, who baptized him in the River Jordan, has been killed been murdered, all for show, all as a parlor trick for those in power. All for entertainment. Now when he heard this, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat 
to a deserted place. A grief-ridden, shocked Jesus is told horrible news and tries to get some shelter in the safety of a deserted place, a place where no one and no thing is. He's trying to get some peace and some solitude, a, a place to grieve, a place where he can set down the role of rabbi and just cope with the loss of a family member. be away from the world, to allow his grief to feel, to, to fill this deserted place, to let his tears soak the dry ground, to let his cries to God be the only thing heard. Jesus, like us, needs time to grieve. Jesus like us, sometimes doesn't want to be in the limelight. Jesus, like us, just sometimes needs some space. But the people followed. The work followed him. The grief of others followed him. The cares of the people Jesus loved followed him. He turned on his out-of-office reply to his work email, and they showed up at the Airbnb. And the scriptures say that he had compassion on them. A movement in his stomach, a word that only the Greeks could come up with. We say compassion. They would say splogmizomai. That's right. There's a G, then a CH, then an N, all smashed in the middle of that word with a Z in there too, just for good measure. Splogmizomai. You can hear it bubbling up out of the bowels. Try it with me. Splogmizomai. Splogmizomai. can't turn away from the people. They're waiting for him here in this deserted place. And there's no place for Jesus to hide. He cures some of the sick. He teaches. And after a long day of this, he tells the disciples to get them some food. And I have to wonder if this statement comes from his exhaustion, just like how we, when we're at our wit's end, will say things that in normal circumstances make total sense, but in the circumstance we're currently in, baffles other people. And yet he sticks with it. He leans into it. You feed them. And becomes this communion-like, this Eucharistic meal a worship service for the people who were tired, for the disciples who were tired, for Jesus and the many others who were grieving John's death. All we've got is a few loaves and a few fish. We can't feed the multitude with that. There's no way it'll be enough to fill all of them. It's just this little amount. When we're at our wit's end, when our world seems to be bursting at the seams because it's so full, we can try and relieve that stress by just packing more things in. Maybe it's food or drink or Netflix or sex or work or working out. You pick your fancy. In moderation, completely healthy. But at our wit's end, when we seek to fill a void and to aid our grief, to give us meaning, we add more to that hole, to that gaping hole that's inside of us. Because it seems like no thing can fill it. Maybe not even God, because at times, in those moments, it can feel like God is silent or aloof. What do we do? at our wit's end. Jesus, at his wit's end, here, brings it back to worship, to communion, to a gathered community sharing a simple meal. 
The same verbs that we'll say in just a moment are the same verbs used here. He takes, he blesses, he breaks, and he gives. And something happens. This miracle of sorts happens. Everyone has what they need. In this act of worship, the needs of the people, the physical and the spiritual needs, are taken care of. In this communal worship, it seems that it is an antidote of sorts to the needs we have, filling us better than any Friends episode or pint of Ben and Jerry's ever could. But it's just some bread. And for them, it was just some fish, and for us, just a small cup. There's no way it'll be enough sustenance. It's just a little amount. What kind of fullness can there be in this little juice cup or this tiny slice of bread? What kind of life can fit into this cup? Surely not the overflowing life, bursting at the seams life that we experience each and every day. There's an artist by the name of Dave Aidy who was actually born up in Denville, New Jersey, who you have a photo of one of his installations in your bulletin. If you're joining us online, you can see it on the online bulletin. He mixes and plays with his faith and with art in ways that make you scratch your head initially, but then as you sit with the art, you start to see that it reveals itself and begins to scratch an itch in your very soul allowing you to see God, allowing you to see the divine and the ordinary in new ways in your own life. This project that you see here is called Fill My Cup. And it's easy to see at the top that there are trash cans that neatly fit into one another. That whisk There's a wicker basket in there too, and maybe you see that five-gallon orange bucket. I think it's probably from Home Depot. I could be wrong. If you keep going down, maybe your eyes are good enough that you can even see the KFC bucket that's in there. Keep going down, what else do you see? Maybe you'll see that there's a cup of noodles, a coffee cup. Everything fitting tightly into one another in this upside down pyramid. All the way down into a communion cup. There's no way that that communion cup can hold our whole world, could hold all of our needs, could include all of the sustenance to keep us going, to hold all the things that we love and we loathe, to hold our whole lives in there. Maybe it can. When we're at our wit's end, when we're desperately hoping that something, some morsel, some little cup even, might be able to hold the world or to hold our world, to be the physical and the spiritual nourishment that can fill our cups when we've been trying to fill them with other things, worship and communion becomes our lifeline. It's just a little cup. It's just a little bread. But it's Jesus who transforms it and transforms us, filling us with the love, with the grace, the guidance, the peace, the strength, the consolation that we so desperately need. How do you come to this table today? What is it that you bring to this table? Or maybe another way we could ask it is, what's filling your cup? May we, all of us, who feel like we're at a healthy point in our life, and those of us who are at wit's end, may we continue to follow Jesus' example so that when we get stressed and when we are overworked and when we feel grief, when the world keeps spinning, we'll come back to worship. We'll come back to communion. And we'll believe that the Holy Spirit might just be up to something in our lives through this little cup. That maybe, just maybe, God's love could encapsulate all of the things that are going on in our life. 
maybe, just maybe, we may be filled too. Because if nothing else, we do say that the kingdom is an upside-down one, isn't it? May it be so.